Oh, man, I tell you, um, <laughs> what a difference a week makes, I think, is the only thing that I can say right now. Last Sunday at this time, I was sitting up here and I was thinking such different thoughts than I, I am this th Sunday because uh, on Tuesday, one of our co-founders and our very good friend, Bubba Beecham, died. And uh, some of you are already aware of it. Some of you don't even know who he was. Um, for the last uh, four years, five years or so, he hasn't been participating on Sunday mornings, but always through the 12-step the week and 12-step meetings, several of which he started himself. But um, it just was a reminder, I guess, to me how quickly things can change. Um, a reminder how fragile life is. A reminder how the, the constancy of life that we sort of imagine and take for granted that things as they are are going to continue is, uh, is an illusion. Uh, things can change so quickly. You know, um, since I know some of you don't know Bubba, I, I want to do something that's balanced here. I want to be able to talk about Bubba because he meant so much to us and so much to the effect, but also have a message that, you know, can speak to everybody here. Um, God, what can you say about Bubba? He was kind of a force of nature. He was, he was a unique individual. He was uh, born into a fabulously wealthy family, which, uh, you know, defines certain things, I suppose. He was, uh, he was just the type of guy who was always, I like to say this about Jesus, the first guy in the pool. He was just the guy that was always pushing forward with complete abandon, whether it was in a destructive direction or not. It didn't matter. Whatever he did, he did full on. And some of the stories that I've heard about him back in the bad old days, um, it's is just amazing. He went through about 65 years of his life at full tilt. And the first AA meeting that I ever went to uh, as a guest, uh, Bubba was speaking at. And I'll never forget that he said, it's kind of hard to hit bottom if you never run out of money. And you think about it. Every time he wrecked a car, he got a new one. Every time he went to jail, he got bailed out. Every time something happened, it was fixed for him because the family had the resources to do that. And he managed to go through 65 years that way until at that point he found himself in the hospital with a liver condition and other things that money couldn't fix anymore. And he had to face the realities of life, you know, in a different type of way. And he responded beautifully. He had several of his best friends that were already in the program and had been for decades and kept trying to pull him in and were praying for him to come in and, and find recovery, find sobriety, find the community that they had found in AA. <clears throat> and he did at this point. Thirteen years ago, he entered sobriety, entered the program, and he never looked back after that. And characteristic to Bubba, he entered his sobriety the same way he had entered every other part of his life. He entered it with complete abandon, you know, just dove into it, you know. And, and he was so transformed by the sober lifestyle, by the community that he found newly in this group. And a different kind of spirituality than he had practiced before. That he was transformed. The running joke was that every time that he would identify himself in a meeting, he would say that he was the most grateful guy in the room. You know? Now, sometimes that would spark a little bit of resentment on the part of other people. But he meant it so sincerely. You know? He meant it in, in the way that he just couldn't believe that he was getting these years back when he thought that it was over. And we can say now he got a 13-year freebie that he got to live more of his life and move, move in a new direction. I met Bubba through a mutual friend, Jeff Jones, probably, oh, I don't know, 11, 12 years ago. He was only a couple of years sober when I met him. And I had been kind of, at that point, two to three years in working with the recovery community myself, uh, you know, just kind of moved in by happenstance through music and other things. And I, was, I, was, I felt so at home in the recovery community because I realized that, first of all, everybody's recovering from something. But secondly, because this was the place where people were really capable of change. This is a place where people were pushed to the precipice, where they were finally willing to be honest about who they were and, and the level of their brokenness, and they weren't afraid to show it 
to whoever they were with. I wasn't finding that as an associate pastor in a community church. On Sunday mornings when we all come in, we put our best face on, right? We want to show how good we're doing. We don't want people to know the things that are going on. And in these recovery meetings, it was just the opposite. People just came in as they were and were free to be able to talk about the things that were going on in their lives in a real way. And I realized and recognized that change was here. And then I met Bubba through Jeff. And Bubba was already larger than life in an institution in the AA community, as was Jeff. And uh, Jeff I'd known for many years, and we'd been working together in a recovery um, ministry at another church. And Bubba came in, and then it was like the three musketeers. There was Bubba, and there was Jeff, and there was me. And of course, there are our wives, too. So the original founding group of The Effect 10 years ago was the six of us. It was Bubba and his wife, Judy. It was me and Marion, and it was Jeff and his wife, Lisa, who was also the, our worship leader um, for many of our years that we were together as a band. And I remember those early days so vividly, because you had Jeff, who was just like the crazy man, the wild man, who had all the vision. It was always constantly drawing pictures. And he had this vision of this campus where we were going to have sober living, and we were going to have uh, detox and residential treatment, and we were going to have IOP, and we were going to have a faith community, and we were going to have workshops, and we were going to have all these things all on this one campus. And it sounded pretty good to Bubba and me, too, you know? But uh, we didn't quite get all of that, and we still didn't get all of that. But we came close to putting that all together. And Bubba was always kind of the glue that was holding things together. Bubba was kind of the center of gravity around which <laughs> Jeff certainly was constantly revolving, you know, kind of like a planet or like a, you know, a balloon on a string because he was always banging around everywhere. And then here's Bubba, you know, just, just kind of more centered, kind of pulling back on the reins a bit. And Bubba and I had a little bit different kind of relationship. We sort of revolved around each other. And remembering that he was only, you know, two, three, four years into sobriety when we were starting all of this, he was still working a lot of things out. And we would sit, we'd go to lunch, we'd get together, and we'd talk for hours about spirituality, talk about how does this all work together? What's the intersection between our physicality and our spirituality? How does this work in terms of day-to-day -day choices? How does this work in terms of the attitudes that we have about life? How does this work against the depression that comes upon us at times, against the difficulties of trying to find new ways to do old things with a different paradigm. You know? How do you learn to have fun again as, as a sober person? How do you learn to socialize again as a spiritual person? Do things have to change? Or don't they have to? These are all the kinds of questions that, that came right down to the grassroots level as Bubba and I would have these long talks. And it was just, it was beautiful. It was, it was interesting. It was, of course, bonding for the two of us to be able to just get together and talk this way and share everything that was going on. Bubba was my friend. He was just my good friend. And even though I was seeing him less and less as the, the years, the months, and the, the last few weeks went by, just knowing that he was there, that he was out there, that I could call him and every fifth time actually get him on the phone, you know, because he didn't, he wasn't pretty, he wasn't very good at answering phone. He was totally old school. There was no email. There was no texting, you know. It was just uh, Bubba's way. But he was there, and he was there for me personally whenever I needed him, and he was there for us as a community, always. We owe so much to Bubba, you know, so much to everything that he did for us all these years. Last time I saw him, we went out to lunch with his son, Rob, right over here uh, across the street. And then after lunch, we came back here and just toured the facility here because we hadn't moved in yet. You know, We were still just trying to figure out what we were going to be able to do. Uh, his son, Rob, hadn't seen it yet. Bubba had seen it once, sort of. And um, we just walked through, and we talked about things, and we dreamed again. And he was so excited about this new place. He was so excited by the look of it, the way that the, the feel of the room where all the meetings were going to take place. He was looking forward, since we had moved so much closer to his house, to being a part again of things, to be able to be here more. And as it turned out, he never got to attend a single meeting here. You know, 
His health had declined so much in the last six months. He was spending a lot more time in the hospital, going to emergency. He was spending a lot more time at doctors and just at home, ill. Um, some of you may remember even last May uh, when we had our 10th anniversary celebration, he was supposed to be here and accept a, a gift, a token of appreciation and speak to us. And he couldn't make it. He was sick that day. So his daughter and his son-in-law came and accepted the award and spoke on his behalf. But it's been like that, you know, increasingly. And uh, two weeks ago, the family put him on hospice. But not so much because they thought it was the end of life. They just needed more help with him on a 24-7 basis. And so everybody was a little shocked. And at about uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, when I got a phone call and I looked down and I saw that it was his son's name on the phone, I knew. I, I just knew. And I picked up the phone, and sure enough, he had died about an hour before. And Rob called me. It is a shock to know suddenly that someone that you have lived so much of your life with, you're not going to see again. I still can't get my head around the fact that I'm not going to hear that gravelly voice that he had, you know, that laugh of his. You could walk through the courtyard at our old place, and you could just hear Bubba's voice cutting through and that laugh cutting through. And everything was well because Bubba was there. It was that kind of feeling, you know. And the sense of humor that he had and the way that he kidded around with us. <laughs> I lo his outgoing messages were just fun. He just had to just call him up just to hear the outgoing message, which he probably would because he wasn't going to pick up the phone anyway. But uh, I just remember him saying, oh, I'm so glad you called. This is his outgoing message. I'm so glad you called. I really want to talk to you. Well, at least I think I am because I don't know who you are, you know. <laughs> but this is just the way that he was with everything, the way that he approached life, you know. Gosh. In our time as a ministry, we've had four significant deaths that I can point to that, that have really kind of rocked our world. And the first one, and I'm glad Vernon is here today, our bass player, because the first one was his daughter, Vanessa. You know, that was only a couple years into our ministry or so. And she was just an institution. She was just part of everything. She was in her early 20s, and she was just such a ray of light in everything that we did. And then she was gone. And then there was Jeff, our, my other co-founder there. And... Uh, Three years ago, he relapsed, and he was gone. And then there was Lenny a couple of years ago, and he was gone, and now Bubba. And so every time we lose someone, it's, it's kind of go, we go through a bit of a redefinition, you know, a reevaluation. Certainly all the internal processes have to go through as we move through our stages of grief in whatever way that we do. Wednesday, I had the uh, privilege me, Nina, and my wife, to be able to sit in on the AA meeting. That's uh, the Wednesday night 615 AA meeting, which is kind of the, the flagship 12-step group of our week. And it was Bubba's baby. He started that meeting along with a core group of individuals that are still there and still coming. And to be able to sit in on that meeting, just kind of the, the fly on the wall in the back, and listen to the shares that were happening. This is one day after he passed. There were people there that I had never met before, that I didn't know, that were telling these stories of how Bubba had touched them, the influence that he had had on them at key points in their sobriety. You know, Frank told a great story about when he was in early sobriety and being bussed in the druggy buggies to, uh, to meetings. There was this one meeting where the secretary who sat up at the table in front had this 500 watt electric smile. And Frank said, I just thought, I didn't know who this guy was, couldn't remember his name from week to week, but if I could get that smile, if I could smile like that, then everything would be okay. Just a smile. He had these huge, brilliant white teeth and he just literally lit up the room when he smiled, you know. And I think Frank, you, you, you got the smile. You ever seen Frank smile? His eyes disappear, you know? It's just really cool. <laughs> so he's got the smile. But that was Bubba. And I, and I, I got a sense of this, the, the, the reach, you know, the influence, the effect that one life had on so many people. As much as I was aware of how he affected me and affected the effect and others, there was more out there that I had no idea of. And it was so great to just be able to sit there and hear and listen. And I know that it's easy to overstate a person's life in retrospect, and I, I don't want to, you know, to, to gloss over the fact that, of course, Bubba was human. He was imperfect, you know? Everything that 
made him who he was in terms of that spontaneous moment-to-moment -moment kind of living that was so beautiful over there was not so great when you're trying to hold to a schedule or get things done. It was frustrating. There, were, there was a push and pull, the regular push and pull of life. But Baba, Baba always brought something to everything that he did that just left us all better than he found us at every encounter. And that's what I'll remember most about Bubba. He was always leaving me better. Last week, I was talking about the Father's love. I was talking about the radical nature of this love, that we don't get how radical the Father's love is, and that the only way that we're ever going to be approaching that kind of love, that kind of absolute, unconditional love, is like a trapeze artist. Whatever bar that you swung in on, you're going to have to let go of it in order to grab the next one. You can't hold on to both at the same time. You're going to have to take that leap. You're going to have to let go and free fall into what's coming next. It's the only way this works. Jesus was so, so direct, so clear about what it looks like to really follow him into a place of complete freedom. And the only way we get that freedom is by really apprehending this love. And the only way we're going to get the love is by letting go of the old ideas, letting go of what limits us, letting go of everything that we think we know, and just falling in and trusting that bar is going to be there to grab onto. You know, Bubba was that kind of person. Maybe he was used to letting go anyway, because he did it to his detriment for so many years. But when faced with a new way of living life, to his credit, he did the same thing. He let go. He grabbed the next thing that was coming. He trusted that it was going to be there, and it was. Bubba let go of the bar. He fell into this new reality of life, and it changed him so dramatically that it couldn't help but change the people around him. Anybody who was really paying attention, anyone who had eyes to see and ears to hear, was moved and changed by their connection with Bubba. Last week, I talked about my friend Lou. This man that I knew before I was ordained as a pastor, and at the end of his life, when he had refused dialysis and we went to visit him and saw him the last time in the hospital room, he looked at my wife and me, and his last words to us, with all of the focus, right? All of the focus of a deadline looming, the end of his life. And his words to us were, love each other. Just love each other. And kid around a little bit. <laughs> and we talked about how it's the kidding around that really defines the love. It's the kidding around that is the proof of love. Not just a decision made through gritted teeth and white knuckles that we're going to obey, that we're going to do good things, but the ability to kid around, the ability to be playful with your relationships is the proof that you really did let go of the old justice and obedience bar and grabbed onto something absolutely pure, this kind of love. Lou did that. Lou made you feel when he looked at you and smiled at you that you were the only person in the room. And when he kidded around with, with you, you knew that you were loved. Bubba was the same way. He made you feel like that. He made you feel better. He kidded around with us because the choice that he had made had gone so deep that he could just live it with that kind of freedom, that kind of abandonment. Bubba had that playfulness. I've heard from several people, his uh, daughter and a couple of close friends who were with him in the last couple of days before he passed, that he was saying to them, I want to go home. Now, they were thinking maybe he had also had a stroke because he wasn't communicating very well. And so they would tell him, Bubba, you are home, thinking that he was delirious or something. You are home, Bubba. And then he'd get really agitated, and he'd say more forcefully, I want to go home. And a couple of times he screamed at them, I want to go home. Now they understand what he was talking about that they didn't get at the time. There was a, an awareness in him. There was a knowing that he was approaching the end. He was tired. He was tired of fighting all these health problems for so long, obviously. He told me that several times. Tired of going to the doctors, tired of spending so much time 
in medical facilities. He wanted to go home. And that kind of awareness at the end of life, that kind of peace with end of life, reminded me of Paul. When Paul's writing in 2 Timothy, which was written from his prison cell, his second Roman imprisonment. The first one was kind of a, you know, it's kind of a club med kind of imprisonment. He got to live in his own rented house. You know, he could kind of have people come and go. It was just under house arrest, and so he could see who he wanted to see. And he was very upbeat when he writes in Philippians in that first imprisonment, very upbeat. And he knows that he's going to get out. By 2 Timothy, his tone is so different. He knows he's not going to get out. And this is the Emperor Nero after the Roman fire, most scholars believe, in terms of the timing of this thing, where Nero had blamed the Christians for a fire that he probably set himself because he wanted to clear out the areas and build new buildings and do what he needed to do. But he was using the Christians as a scapegoat, and his persecution was fierce. And here was Paul caught up in the middle of that. And this time, he was probably in a cell. This time, he was probably literally bound and in chains. And at this time, he didn't get to see his friends, and the people around him. But I want to read a little bit, and it's in your, your inserts, or you can take a look up top. At 2 Timothy 4, right at verse 5, listen to what Paul says here. You, Timothy, he's writing to, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which, is, which the Lord, the, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You hear what's going on here? He knows he's at the end. He's not getting out of this one. But he has fought the good fight. He has finished the course. He has kept the faith. There's a sense of his completing, not the task, because the task goes on. He, he's, he's coaching Timothy here. You do the same thing. Continue to endure things. Continue to stay sober. Sober, not sober the way we think of sober. Aware, grounded, present. And keep the ministry going. He knows this goes on. He's only had this small slice. But in terms of his perseverance, in terms of his constancy, in terms of his integrity, he did what he set out to do, and he never stopped. He continued that pace. He continued that direction until the buzzer was sounding, until the bell went off. And that was something that he could take to heart. I see Bubba in the same way. He was able, at the end, to say, I want to go home. I'm done. But he realized for 13 years he had been constant. For 13 years he had been able to continue on in this direction with this kind of integrity. Paul continues, make every effort to come to me soon. He's talking to Timothy, his protege. For Damas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica, and Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful for, to me for service. Baticius I have sent to Ephesus. And he's just lonely. Can you see it? Can you read between the lines here? Can you hear what's going on? Three of his closest companions have all gone in different directions. Luke is still there. But he's smarting over the loss of his friends, the loss of companionship, the loss, I suppose, of the work that he was doing with everybody. You know, He longs to be with his friends. I love this letter because it is so human. It gives us a glimpse into not just the big themes, not just the theological principles, you know, the quote-unquote masterpieces of our faith, but this is just a letter to a person from a hurting person someone who knows that he's at the end of the road. And then what he says next is even, even better. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. He's just looking for the things that gave him comfort, the things that felt like home. How many of us have felt the same way? You know? 
that old jacket that you put on and it just feels so good and it has that smell and it has all those memories that come attached to it. He wants his cloak. It's probably cold in his cell. You know, I, I just, we can't miss these things. These precious few details that the scripture gives us that shows the humanness of the heroes of our faith are reminding us that they aren't so separated from us that they do things that we could never do. They're just like us. But they're fighting the good fight, right? They're running the course. They're keeping the faith. At my first defense, he writes, Oh, Alexander the coopersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. A little bit snarky there. A little bit of resentment, huh? Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Ah, you just got to love this stuff. <coughs> At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Okay, he's coming back. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so does Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. It's just a letter, like so many that we've written. You know, greetings from this person and that person. All of this coming together. And then embedded in that, please come. Make every effort to be here before winter. What is he saying? Before it's too late, please come. I really want to see you. I want to go back and highlight one of these lines in this passage that is kind of obscure, seemingly insignificant, and we can blow right past it. But embedded in that is a really significant bit that I think may help us, not only as we process our grief for our loved ones who are lost, but also as we go forward, Going back to the first paragraph, or the second paragraph, make every effort to come to me soon, for Damas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So what it sounds like there is Damas, having loved this present world, split. You know, it sounds like maybe he went into international banking or something where he could make a ton of money. He's gone back to the material world, right? That's what it, if we just read this with our own sensibilities, that's what it sounds like. This is where getting back into the, the Hebrew roots helps us so much to get to the deeper meaning, the meaning that will be significant to us. Because this present world is really more or less an idiomatic phrase. It was a phrase that was well developed in rabbinical Judaism. And they would have understood the phrase as Paul was writing it. Any Jew would have understood the phrase. You know, the, uh, the word that he used there is olam heretz. Olam Hezeh. Olam Hezeh can literally mean this present world. But what the Jews meant by this present world, Olam Hezeh, is the physical world in which the only interface with a spiritual God, a God who is completely spirit, is through mitzvah. <coughs> it's through the righteous deeds, the righteous acts that we can do. It's through the Jewish system it's through the purity codes. Everything that it meant to, been, to be a Jew, everything that the Jews did under the law, was their interface in this present world, Alam Hazeh, with their God. And so Alam Hazeh would be a kind of shorthand for Judaism itself or the Jewish people. What is Paul saying here? That Damas deserted the Gentile ministry that he was participating in with Paul to go back to the Jewish community at Thessalonica, most likely. It's a different kind of understanding. One of the main controversies during Paul's day and what he was fighting constantly was between the Judaizers and the Gentiles. The Judaizers were those Jews who followed Jesus who said you had to be a Jew in order to follow Jesus. And they were trying to convert everyone, they were trying to circumcise them, they were making them follow the, the dietary codes and the purity codes, and Paul was saying, no, 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 you don't have to do that. 
there is a new sheriff in town, so to speak. You know, there is the end of that law and the beginning of a law of liberty, as James called it. And so this was the fight. And here, Damas had gone back to the Jewish system, to this present world. But the interesting thing about Alam Hazeh is that it's always used in conjunction with and in contrast to Olam Haba, which you may have heard in here before. Olam Haba is usually translated as the world to come. But actually, that's not even really accurate because there's an imperfect verbal construction in there. And so the real way to translate Olam Haba is the world coming, or we would say the coming world, the present world and the coming world. Why is it important to make that distinction? Because we're automatically going to think of Olam Haba, the world to come or the coming world, as a heaven of the next life, which we think as a separate place with its own geography, its own topography, its own flora and fauna. We think of it as being this completely mutually distinct place. We leave one and we enter the other. But to the Jewish mind, what they're really saying is, this is a world that is always becoming. It is not discontinuous from this present world. It connects to this present world. And every act of righteousness we do here in this present world, in Olam Hazeh, is reconstructing the perfect creation from the garden of Alam Haba, the world that is coming. There is a sense that this world is already here, but not yet, <laughs> if you can grasp that. And to the Jewish mind, to hold on to these paradoxes, to hold on to unresolved issues in one embrace is the hallmark of their ability to deal with life as it is and not have to change it into something else. We here now in this present world with the only interface we have with our, with our Father, our, our, our God, the Spirit of God, is through our choices, through our acts of righteousness. And every one that we do, not just because we're supposed to obey, every time we do connect with each other, bring that vulnerability to bear, find the freedom to be playful in our love, we are reconstructing the world that is always coming as well. We become ready for the world that is coming as we enter into the world that is already here. It's this beautiful understanding that the Jews had of living here now between heaven and earth, and that our job as humans was to bring earth to heaven and heaven to earth. In other words, to merge the two in the only moment that we'll ever have, which is this present moment right here and right now. This is what Jesus means by kingdom. Kingdom is the living in, as if Olam Haba is already here, in this present world now, as if something else is true. And with every act in that moment, it becomes true. Literally, it becomes real in that moment to us, if we will just finish the course, keep the faith, fight the good fight, keep showing up to these moments with that kind of perseverance and integrity and playfulness and abandon. You know, often I have thought that I wish that I could have walked with Jesus. Anyone ever had that thought? Gosh, I wish I could have just walked with Jesus just for a day, just give me a day. I want to see his face. I want to hear the words coming. I want to see the light in his eyes. I want to see that interaction. I just want to, if I had that, just that one imprint, I could go through, that would be my burning bush. I could just go through the rest of life if I could just have that. You know what, in actuality, I don't need to. I got to walk a while with Lou Sauer. I got to walk a while with Bubba Beecham. These were men who had let go of one bar and grabbed onto another, and in that free fall, found something so real that it changed them. It changed them, and it's been changing me ever since. In their transformed lives, I have seen my Savior. In their ability to laugh and play with me and leave me better than they found me, I have found my God. And I'll tell you what, if I or any of us can't see God 
in these transformed lives, in these miracles that are happening right in front of us, then we're simply not ready to see. We're not ready to go there yet. And so the prayer is, Father, help me see right in front of me, right now in this present world, what I can do to enter in so that I can celebrate a life like my friend Bubba's. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Bubba. Thank you that he was finally able to see who you really are. Thank you that in our interaction with him, we can get glimpses of who you really are. Help us to all go where Bubba went. Help us to go where you go every day. Help us to see that this moment right now is sacred, is sanctified by your presence. And all we need to do to have worship in spirit and truth, to have church, is to simply enter in. No matter what we're doing or where we are, this is it. Thank you for the models in our life who show us the way over and over again. Help us to be those models in the lives of other people as we go forward as well. Father, you are our God and we are your people. Help us every day to live more and more as if that were really true. We love you and we can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.